This is Two Girls, One Ghost. Two Girls, One Ghost. And I'm really excited about today's episode. Also, where your ghost is, that's Corinne. <laughs> and Hi. I'm Sabrina. I found a new obsession. I'm not going to spoil it until we get to that point in the episode, but it has nothing to do with the topic. It is a weird side tangent that I went down that I became <laughs> obsessed with. That's so good. Okay. Well, now I like want to just go into the episode because now you're teasing <laughs> us with Well, this. okay. Before we do that, though, I would love to know, is there an update on your household ghost? Okay. Actually, yesterday when we were recording and I had to pee in the middle and took a little break, I was racking my mind because there was an update, but I can't remember anything anymore because my brain is a goldfish and I can't remember what happened. Because you've been doing a lot of construction. So I was curious if your ghosty has been acting up. No, there totally was. But like, I, I truly cannot remember. But I remember when it happened, I was like, oh, I have to tell Sabrina. And then five seconds passed. <laughs> the thought was gone. And the memory of what happened was gone too. So I have no clue. Are you... A little bit like Dory lately. 100%. I told everyone on Camp Stories, my brain with the pregnancy has been so horrible. Like people talk about like mom brain or whatever. I didn't realize there was like full on pregnancy brain where like you truly. I already was starting to lose my memory. I think I already am like at risk for early onset Alzheimer's to be honest. But I'm so non-observant. I don't know what's going on. And I told (laughs) you and everyone else at Camp Stories the other day. Yes that I'm not good at driving anymore. And I'm a pretty damn good driver. I'm pretty cautious. Within like the span of 90 minutes, I, one, parked on the sidewalk and didn't realize until I came back. And I was like, how did I not feel myself literally going up on the curb? That was confusing. That is. So then I was like kind of punishing myself a little bit in my brain, being like, Jesus Christ, you need to pay attention, like be a better driver. I drive to the next place I'm supposed to go. I park, go inside, meet Brian. A couple hours later, come out. He goes did you get a handicapped parking pass? I said, no. He goes, then why are you parked in a handicapped spot? I had no idea. And it's been haunting me. I'm humiliated by it. I I took someone's spot. (laughs) They could have needed it more than me. I know, but you didn't mean to. You weren't being malicious. I didn't mean to, but it really did. Now I'm like nervous to drive. I've been having Brian drive me everywhere. And there are some stores, I think, where they have like parking spots for like pregnant women or for new moms because- Yeah, like the expecting mother. I haven't seen one. I literally saw a video on TikTok and this is like, I have not scrolled TikTok in months, but the other night I was just like so beat from like how we've been working like 12 hour days, it feels like. So I just was Mm -hmm. like, I just need to like turn off my brain. And there was a video of a dad at Home Depot and he was a father of triplets, baby triplets. I saw this. (laughs) And he's like trying to maneuver and put them on like one of those big Home Depot cars. Yeah, but they won't fit. And so he has to kind of like use suspension rods to dangle one of them off of the top rod. (laughs) And it was so funny. Like it took a long time. And someone was like, what a Home Depot dad. The fact that he's like doing a DIY project in the parking lot before actually even being able to go in and shop. But then people were praising him because they were like, you know, not every person would do this. A lot of people would give up or they would call their partner and be like, I don't know what to do. But he didn't. He figured it out on his own. He was like, I've got this, whether it takes 30 minutes or two minutes. Yeah. He was solving that problem. Okay. Can I tell you one more weird pregnancy thing? And I feel like I've been talking about my belly button a little bit too much, but I'm going to do it again, especially because I tried to tell Brian and he like could not handle it. Yesterday, like at the end of the day, because I had eaten quite a bit and like, you know, you expand throughout the day. Yeah. I took a evening shower and I caught a glimpse of myself in the mirror and I was like, what is wrong with my belly button? Because there was like this white line circling it. And I realized my belly button is getting so far pushed out that all of the skin that has never seen daylight is now there. And I have like a white <laughs> ring around it. I know. It's so gross. I tried to chill Brian. He's like <laughs> gagging. I feel like three days ago I was I'm like, so oh, I might get naughty. I think I'm getting close. It's so gross. No one talks about this shit. No one. How was I to know? It makes so much sense, but it's also like so disturbing. Right. Because people are like, oh, you might have an Audi. And then you think like, okay, like my belly gets bigger. My belly button might be an Audi. But you don't think about like the process and the journey to get to there. The untanned skin that pops out. Yeah. I have a white ring around my belly button. I truly feel like when I'm pregnant, like I'm going to find like a seashell from Cape May circa 2002. Your childhood hermit crab, that's where he went. <laughs> <You're> like, 
I found my new shell and now you're kicking me out. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you died long ago. It's been I feasting. have like full shivers from how uncomfortable this makes me. Wait, but can I show you <laughs> the Oracle and Tarot decks that I just found when I was doing like a big clean out? Yes. Okay. I'm really excited about both of these. You've got a lot of good decks. Cat Tarot. Oh, wait, did, we, did someone give you that when we were on tour? I'm not sure if it was on tour, but these are all gifted to us by listeners. So this is 78 Cards and Guidebook, illustrated by Megan Lynn Cott. It's so cute. Cat Tarot, so cute. Aww. And then either you gave this to me or a listener gave this to me. The Literary Witches Oracle. I think I gave that to you. Did you? I think it was right after we heard the Oracle and Tarot decks are supposed to be gifted and you're not necessarily like purchased for yourself. And I think a few years ago I gave that to you. Okay, written by Tasia Kitaisky. Kiaia, illustrated by Katie <laughs> Horan. You can look at it on the YouTube if you want to understand why I could not pronounce that. <laughs> also, I feel like I've been talking about Litha a lot recently, but I follow her on TikTok. But Litha is one of our spooky community members that we have, haunted one of our friend. most haunted friends. And there's this like Uno machine that she tagged playing- us. Yes. And she was making comments about how like you could put a tarot deck in the Uno shuffling machine and how sick that would be. And then she had an even more genius idea that you leave one of the Uno cards in there, but it's like the Uno reverse card. So you have to, as a tarot reader, when you're doing it for someone else, if you pull that card, sorry, the reading is now about you. You have some self-reflection to do. And I was like, that is oh my god, so brilliant. I think that's the best idea it's ever. It's so good. I feel like you should just like mix more than just like the reverse card. There should be like the stop card, like the block. Monopoly, go to jail. <laughs> <laughs> Add from like all the different games. Yeah. Well, game of life. You have three kids now. We can make our own special deck inspired yeah. by Litha and all of her just taking her ideas. <laughs> but I really want everyone to know I'm going to do a Oracle versus Tarot episode very soon because it's something that I feel like I mm. don't know necessarily like the origins I don't of know the either difference. and the difference. And I, because I've become so much more invested in like a journey of using Oracle cards and stuff in the mornings, I want to educate myself as well as potentially yeah. all of you. I will subscribe to that episode. You will? I'll sit here patiently and I will listen and learn and it will be great. Okay. Well, you know what else will be fantastic is this episode today because it's spooky, it's fun, and it's unnerving. It's got it all. Alrighty. First question for you, Corinne. Have you ever inherited anything from your family members? I'm not sure if inherited is the right word because that makes me think that someone died and then part of the will was giving me this item. That didn't happen. My grandparents, when we bought this house, my grandparents gave me a, what do you even call it? It's like a a side table that my great grandmother, Emilia, from the Azores in Portugal, she owned. So I have that. That's the oldest thing I think I have. That's nice. I've had, so when my grandmother passed away, I, I was actually gifted a lot of jewelry and I have some like old photos and stuff. So I guess like it wasn't necessarily left in a will, but it was more gifted to me after she passed. Yeah. Like my dad gave me his dad's old stereo, which was like already an antique stereo, but it doesn't work. It's there's nothing connected. So if it ever turned on, that would probably be the scariest thing in the world because there's no wiring in it. That would be just for display. (laughs) But I love that. That's so nice. Oh, and my I have that trunk from my Uncle Dickie because he would restore. I basically inherited that because when he passed away, one of the things that he did in his life, because he was really big into antiquing and restoration, he would take these vintage antique trunks and he would restore them. And so So for a wedding gift, his son gave me one of the trunks. So nice. (laughs) I know. And then you also, you do a lot of antique shopping. So you have a lot of antiques in your home. Yeah. Between the two of us, we have a lot of old items scattered throughout our places. Yes. And our souls are very old as well. Well, I feel like oftentimes when you think of heirlooms or you think of antiques, there's a lot of joy associated with it. Yes. Like sometimes it means you've lost someone, a loved one, but I feel like it is such a gift to be given items that belong to loved ones or even just items that have like transcended history and continue to Mm -hmm. exist in our time today. Whether it's the old photo album that was under grandma's bed, the pearls from Auntie Susie, or your great-great-grandmother's engagement ring, 
Inheriting these pieces usually instills some sense of joy. That isn't always the case. Sometimes an inheritance can curse you and your bloodline for eternity and lead to death and curse after curse. That's the type of heirloom we are talking about today. <laughs> Lovely. <sighs> this is the story of the cursed amethyst. So I'm adding a photo of an amethyst stone in our YouTube video. They're beautiful. Corinne, you and I, actually a listener, gifted us this like really beautiful amethyst stone a couple years ago. And I wish I had it right with me, but I don't. Oh, the, the really big ones? Mm-hmm. I do have mine. It's just too high up on my bookshelf because it's operating basically as a, a bookend. Yeah, it's because it's beautiful. It's big. It's beautiful. Yeah, and it's heavy. Mm-hmm. I screamed when I opened the box. <laughs> it was awesome. It is a variation of quartz, but it's violet. It is the birthstone of February. And the name of the stone comes from the Greek words meaning not intoxicate. There are a couple of rabbit holes that we're going to go down in this episode. The first one is about the origin of amethyst in ancient Greece. Okay. So why does the word translate to not intoxicate in Greek? Because that's curious. It's like a very interesting, specific term. Right. Yeah. And that is because ancient Greeks believed the stone would protect the owner from getting drunk and intoxicated and losing their wits. I know another way you could do that. <laughs> not drink? Not drink, but apparently no. That's not good enough. You have to add something to your drink. No, it's like you put it in your pocket. Like you don't even put it in your drink. You put it in your pocket. And if it's oh, wow. on your person, you would not lose your marbles while drinking. See, that's so different than if I could have predicted what it would have been. I thought it was going to be a little less direct. I thought it was going to be like, oh, if someone puts like a love spell or something on you, like you won't succumb to that type of spell. Well, it is kind of like that. And I, I was curious if it's like, you put it in your pocket and in case someone like slipped something in your drink or like overserved you, you would be protected. Mm -hmm. But I really, truly think it's just while you drink, here's a way to <laughs> make sure you don't get too drunk. To be less drunk. But there is a legend in ancient Greece and a lot of like, you know, Greek mythology about Bacchus, the god of intoxication, wine and grapes. He was pursuing a young woman named Amethyst. And despite his godliness, Amethyst was like, mm-mm. Not for me. I actually really am not interested in you, God of intoxication. <laughs> like, turn your pursuits elsewhere. Yeah. And so Amethyst prayed to the goddess Diana to help her remain chaste in her efforts of, like, I don't want to be with you. And the goddess Diana heeded her prayers. And in heeding her prayers, she turned Amethyst into a stone. Because what better mm -hmm. way to not give in to a god if you're not a human? Right. You're just a rock. You're now a rock. Looking out on the valley with googly eyes alongside your mother rock. Yes. Just be a rock. So then it said that this god, Bacchus, was humbled by this action. And as like a gift to Amethyst, this stone that Diana had turned her into was like a white stone. But as a gift, he poured red wine over the stone, kind of as an offering. And the crystals turned violet, which then created the Amethyst stones. Mm. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. I like this. Yeah. This is cool. It's like a fun like yeah. origin of how the gods created the stone. Because this is more interesting than me giving you the chemical makeup of amethyst, the stone, <laughs> because no one would understand it. What happens in the rock bed? How do I find myself some red jasper around here? There was the the like chemical compounds, like the XX3, you know, I'm just making up things. But I was like, I hardly understand that. I'm not going to give that to you guys. No. In classical ancient Greek texts, the goddess Rhea gifts Dionysus with the amethyst stone to preserve the wine drinker's sanity. So that is kind of where the belief came from. And it was mm. perpetuated through Greek mythology. So since then, over time, amethyst stones have actually been used for preventing intoxication. But then, you know, different societies have different purposes for it. It's been used for healing, for mindfulness, and in jewelry, and so much more. It was found and dated as early as 2000 BC in France. Ancient Egyptians used the amethyst gemstone for engraved gems. Medieval Europeans believed the amethyst stone could keep soldiers safe and cool-headed in battle. So a lot of soldiers would carry the stone with them on their person during battle. Wow. And the stone has been found in Anglo-Saxon graves in England and were believed to keep the souls of the deceased 
safe. I feel like there has to be some real proof to these things working because the fact that we have assigned these sort of like mystical properties to crystals and stones and that throughout centuries and centuries people have used them. I feel like that to me is proof that something is happening because otherwise I would have thought that some of that would have fizzled out and died out. And it was just like a fad that people believed in. It kind of reminds me a lot of like Eastern non-traditional medicine, you know, Mm -hmm. where they have dated centuries back and predate modern day medicine but have been yeah. proven to have benefits in our work. Totally. So some people believe the stone, hey, Corinne, this is for you, can increase wealth. Hey, give me, give me. <laughs> and others believe that the stone can actually help remove negative unwanted energies and drive away daily hazards. So the point here being is that amethyst, the stone, is believed to have so many amazing and incredible and powerful properties And it was included as one of the most valuable gemstones up until the 18th century. So you would imagine that, you know, back in the day, if you found an amethyst stone, you would be like, bazinga, I hit the mother load. Especially a big one. Oh, and we're about to talk (sighs) about a big one. How big? (laughs) I feel like that was a call and response. (laughs) What show is that from? I don't know, but I feel like there is some sort of show or skit where that does happen. Sorry, I'm like constantly picking at myself. It's okay. I'm just always sweating. I really want to do like a, what's the show that's like Moiri, Maori? Mori? Mori. Like, why do I want to do a podcast episode where it's like the chaos of it is like Mori? (laughs) Show me your stone. You think your stone's bigger than mine? Uh, That'd be so good. I could see that in like a big mouth sort of style where it's just like a cartoon version. Ghost chaos. That's what I want. I want a little bit of chaos. Actually, there's a lot of chaos in my life. I don't, I think I want fun chaos. I want paranormal chaos and not yeah personal life chaos. Right. You want to look somewhere else and be like, oh, wow, other people are experiencing chaos. And yeah. it's fun for me to watch this one because it has nothing to do with me. Right. Disassociate from my own life. All right. So back to the big stones. Finding one is one thing. Stealing one is another I feel like that's a surefire way to get on the stone's bad side. So in order for us to really tell the story of the cursed and stolen amethyst, we must go back to the 5th century, where in India, many temples were constructed and built for the Hindu gods. One such temple was the Temple of Indra at Kunpur. It was built for Indra, the Hindu god of war and weather, ruler of the heavens, god of thunder, rain, and great warriors. That is an interesting an important thing to keep note of. Indra is the god of thunder and rain. Okay. This will come thunder back. Thunder and rain. At kind of at the end of this episode. But within this temple, when they built it, people left many offerings and gifts and a specific beautiful amethyst stone. And I'm going to put a picture of a temple. This is not the specific temple. Unfortunately, the temple no longer exists, but this is an example of one of the temples in India at that time. This temple was honored and preserved with such care and respect until the white man entered, crusading, invading, and taking what was not theirs. We know the story well. This is where we could so appropriately put from New Girl Schmitz. A white man? No! (laughs) We should. (laughs) (laughs) This is actually interesting. So my, because my grandmother on my dad's side, my family is from India. But my grandmother was very much like a part of, she's very British and has a lot of British influence. And her family line is very much of this invasion of the Brits in India. Wow. So the Brits first landed in India in 1608. And of course, this is going to be a very, very brief history review. But 1608, and it began first as exploration, the trade, there's a British India trade. I'm not saying that correctly, but Very quickly, it then turned into desire to control and commandeer the region. So basically, the white people did as white people do. They took up arms, sought control through brute force. And in this, they very sadly destroyed a lot of the culture and kind of raided and destroyed some of the temples that were built and disrespected the traditions and the culture. And they took everything that they could, sucking them dry. This temple of Indra was among many of the Kanpur temples to be raided during the British uprising in 1857. 
And a man by the name of Colonel W. Ferris was one of the men who raided this specific temple. Ferris was a Bengal cavalry man who fought with the British. And while raiding the temple of Indra, he stumbled upon something so beautiful, an amethyst gemstone. I'm going to put a photo of an amethyst. Again, this is not the specific stone because it has changed over time. But okay. as an example, just a visual aid for everyone. Colonel W. Ferris was mesmerized. He was like, oh my gosh, this is beautiful. It's massive. Me likey, me wanty, <laughs> me takey. And he stole it. I will say he has not admitted this. He is now no longer with us, but I bet he is rolling over in his grave wishing he had never taken this. So I'm going to give a trigger warning. There are mentions of suicide in this story. It's very brief, but I just wanted to okay. give a warning. So immediately upon returning to England with his new prized possession, Colonel W. Ferris experienced immense loss. Financially, he lost everything. He brought his family to poverty and his entire family began to suffer from strange, unexpected and sudden illness. It was tragedy after tragedy. And also, like, keep in mind, it's the 1800s. It's very possible, like, there was financial ruin and post-war. There are a lot of these things that could be easy to write off as based on the times illness was running rampant, you know. But when you look back at it and you look at how condensed all these events were in this time period, it's curious. Not curious enough to really raise any red flags. Essentially, people are not blaming the amethyst not yet. so clearly yet. Okay. Not yet. So one of the colonel's friends actually kept possession of the stone for a brief period of time. And this is the trigger warning. While the stone was in his possession, he fell into a very, very deep depression and died by suicide. In his will, he like left the stone back to Colonel Ferris. Despite these occurrences, Colonel W. Ferris did not see the connection with the stone, and he passed it down to his son. Uh -oh. His son also started to experience a lot of loss and was never able to recoup the family wealth. Oh, no. This is reminding me of the Hope Diamond. Didn't I feel like we covered that a yeah. long time ago? It is similar. So from there, the stone was passed on to Edward Heron Allen. And I'm not necessarily sure how it went from Colonel Ferris's son to Edward, but it was given. It was like a, I now present to you my stone. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And here is where we're going to go down a couple of rabbit holes and find my new obsession. And I feel like you're going to really like part of this, too. So okay. Edward Heron Allen was a scientist and a writer and a man of many talents who inherited the amethyst in 1890. But I wanted to spend some time talking about Edward before we talk about what happened to him when he came into possession of the stone. Edward Heron Allen was born in London on December 17, 1861. He was the youngest of four children and spent much of his life and his upbringing in grained in academics. He loved school. He loved studying. He had a passion for sciences. And he was just a very curious man. He mm -hmm. became a lawyer. He didn't go to university, but his family, his father had a law firm. And so I guess back in the day, he didn't have to get like a degree or anything. He joined the family business before going to university. So he was a lawyer. And while he was working at his father's law firm, he was like a couple blocks away from this infamous violin maker. And so he would like between jobs and work, go study with his violin maker and learn how to make violins and became obsessed with violins and <laughs> even wrote a book on violin making that you can still find today. I love this. I love that he had a hobby and it was more than a hobby. It was an obsession and he was able just to wait. just, okay. It's, he has one obsession right now that you know of. Mm-hmm. So you can find this book. It's called Violin Making As It Was and Is by Edward Heron Allen. And if you want a signed copy, it's available on eBay for $1,200. $1,200? Okay, well, I get it. It's, it's signed and the guy's dead now. But Jesus. It is a beautiful book. But there are also, I found some for like $40 to like $100 if you are so curious about violin making. <laughs> So clearly, as you can tell, Edward is a very curious man. Despite not going to university, he became a lawyer. He learned the Turkish language, studied Persian, translated ancient texts. Like there was one text of a almost near lost like dialect from, I think, Turkey or somewhere that he mm -hmm. translated to English. He oh, wow. 
gave back to his communities. Like I think he donated this like beautiful organ to a local church. He served in World War I. He joined MI7, which is a branch of the British War's office, like military intelligence. Damn. So this guy like did it all. He was brilliant. He had a lot of passion. He also studied single cell organisms and granular ectoplasms. He wrote on archaeology, Buddhist philosophy. And this one is, this is delicious, literally. He studied and wrote about the gourmet appreciation and culture of the asparagus. This man had ADHD before the rest of us did. (laughs) That is what I can say with confidence. He went from one hyperfixation to the next. (laughs) It is absolutely bananas. And it feels like he's doing all this at once. The asparagus. And here is where my new obsession comes forth. Because asparagus, my friends, naturally, I went down the asparagus rabbit hole or up the asparagus sparrow shoot. I think it's called like sparrowgrass. My gosh, I couldn't find this book, but Edward wrote a book called Asparagus as a Hobby for Amateurs. And it was a very influential guide to growing asparagus in 1934. Oh my God. Well, I feel like you need one because asparagus, growing asparagus feels like a prank. It doesn't feel real that they just grow in stalks out of the ground. Like that's weird. It's super weird. I don't know how they should grow. Maybe as icicles from a tree, but (laughs) not just straight up from the ground. (laughs) Okay. Well, now we're going to go down a rabbit hole of asparagus and I'm going to do a very quick fast facts about asparagus. Are you ready for this? I feel like we need to do like (laughs) some type of music behind this. Asparagus, once called sparrow grass, is native to the eastern Mediterranean lands in Asia Minor. Asparagus spends up to three years in the ground before the plant is harvested, but a plant can last up to 20 years. Releasing Mm. chickens into the asparagus field to forage can actually reduce weed growth by 90% and drastically improve asparagus growth with no adverse effects to the crop itself. During warm weather, you can physically watch asparagus grow up to seven inches in one day. Last year, we spent $22 million on homegrown asparagus that is only accounting for the money spent during asparagus season. In a research done in India in 2011, asparagus was proven to have an aphrodisiac effect on male rats. Asparagus was believed by ancient Greeks to cure everything. Do you have a toothache? Eat asparagus. Do you have heart disease? Eat asparagus. I wonder if they thought that because it makes most people's pee smell bad. So maybe they thought like your disease and toxins were coming out of you. Like being released, maybe. Yeah. But it also might be because Emperor Caesar Augustus loved asparagus so much that he literally organized military units to go procure and import it. And he would have like competitions (laughs) to see who was the fastest runner who could be the fastest to bring him back asparagus. This is okay. It's so bizarre that there was this weird obsession with asparagus. And yet when when chocolate came on the scene, everyone thought it was evil because everyone was obsessed with it. How about asparagus? What Why about are asparagus? People not questioning that. Right? But <laughs> Caesar Augustus, he used to exclaim, and I'm gonna speak this in Latin, so apologies for my pronunciation. Velocious quad asparagus concator translation. Faster than cooking asparagus. AKA Get going already. Hurry the fuck up. This man had an unhealthy obsession with asparagus. Or and maybe now I healthy. do too. <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm obsessed. I haven't felt this obsessed with something since I started learning facts about crows. Just uh, with asparagus? Now you're obs- <laughs> It's so weird. Are you obsessed with asparagus or are you obsessed with other people's obsession with asparagus? That might be the better way to put it. I think I'm obsessed with other people's obsession with asparagus, but that makes me obsessed with asparagus because it has such a cool history of obsession. (laughs) I bet all of you didn't think today you would listen to a paranormal podcast and be inundated with asparagus facts. But you know what? veggies, kids. I did not think that I would have a paranormal podcast, let alone that I would have one and tell everyone about asparagus while on it. So (laughs) you and me, pal. Okay. Every day is a surprise. So Edward Heron Allen, he's got all these obsessions. But on top of this, he also is a writer and he dabbled in writing horror. He wrote fiction. He also apparently wrote erotic science fiction. Okay. Wow. And guess what else he did? He predicted the future. He became an expert on chiromancy or palmistry, so predicting a person's future by interpreting the lines on their palm. He wrote a book on that too, and I think 
he would study people's handwriting and try to interpret like their future based on how they wrote. So it was like the original handwriting analysis, but he took it onto like a paranormal level. Was there just more time in the day? Like, did he just not have to ever have an actual job? Like, how was there time for any of That's this? That's what I'm so or concerned about. This? It's I literally my next sentence is like based on this resume, was Edward actually some weird vampiric time traveler who just had lived a million years? Because how? How did he do this Or is he a compulsive liar? I don't think he's a compulsive liar because he literally can find all his books and I guess there's like a record of all of it. This is one of those classic things where it's like people joke like, oh, don't let your parents find out about this person because your parents are going to be like, oh, well, why don't you do that? Why can't you do that? Yes. Why aren't you as successful as this person? He's an overachiever for sure. And he was published in like the royal paper for some of his like findings and studies of single cell organisms like he truly yeah he was just a brilliant man who he clearly made an impact on many different industries but i feel like had he hyper fixated on just one thing he probably could have (laughs) formed the atomic bomb but he also really liked archaeology and unfortunately despite his interest in palmistry and reading other people's futures he was blind to his own because he would have thought he would have seen what was coming, and known to make a different choice. Mm. Because his curiosity and his interest in archaeology and history got the better of him and perhaps swayed him and made him a bit blind to what else was in front of him. For when he was gifted the amethyst stone, he did not fear it. He did not pause and say, mayhaps I should not take this stone. He was thrilled to take this stone. Another thing to study. Exactly. So, Edward was given the stone by Colonel Ferris's son as a gift in 1890, and he decided to actually set it in jewelry. So he took it to a jeweler and set it into a silver ring to look like a double-headed snake. I'm pretty sure it's a bracelet. So basically, the stone is set in metal, and it kind of looks like snake-like. It's beautiful. There are other gems now added to it, and this is how it looks today. Despite Edward's previous successes, Edward began to experience a sudden and rapid string of bad luck. When I was like thinking about what happens, I'm like, I feel like now looking at my life, because I could probably, there's probably something I bought or was gifted two years ago. And when I look back at my life the last two years, I was like, oh, it was my Saturn return. It wasn't something that I got, you know? So yeah, I think it's very easy, especially if this is a man who's like investing his time in so many things. I'm sure he's like picking up so many different things. So he doesn't think anything of the fact that he starts to experience bad luck. There's no association with the stone. He started having strange dreams and he kept getting messages from this voice and he couldn't quite make it out. They weren't always clear. He started to hear weird sounds in his home and his family members would see like things out of their peripherals. It was almost like they started to experience a haunting, but it wasn't fully manifested. So what was happening was not clear. Edward then started to experience financial troubles, friendship problems, and relationship issues. These dreams started to become more and more vivid, and eventually he was able to decipher the message. He was being visited by a Hindu deity that wanted to find something. It was looking for something and saying, I need it. I need it back. Where is it? Despite these dreams, Edward did not take heed and was not aware of the fact that it was connected to this stone. So he instead you know, he was like, I put this in this beautiful like setting. Uh, it's a piece of jewelry now. And one of his friends was this like successful singer and he lent it to her to wear for a performance of hers. As the legend goes, this woman is wearing the jewel, the amethyst stone on stage, performing, singing her melodious voice. And uh, like a scene out of Little Mermaid, all of a sudden her voice disappears. It's gone. She loses Whoa. her voice in the middle of the performance. So she's like, well, this is weird. She thinks it's a weird occurrence. She goes on vocal rest and is just like, you know, maybe it's overuse. She returns the Lent jewelry back to Edward and focuses on her recovery. No matter how much hot lemon water and honey, no matter how many doctors she went to, no matter how long she was on vocal rest, she was never able to sing again. That is so weird. It also makes me suspicious of the stone, which it's like, why are you taking things from other people if 
there's some sort of like deity attached to you who's hoping for help. Like, wouldn't you? Well, because it's stolen. Yeah. The white man Ugh. stole this stone and the stone is now going to steal from them. But she was just borrowing it. She wasn't the owner. I know. So she ends up kind of making a comment to Edward and she's like, have you noticed anything weird with the stone? And that's when Edward starts to piece it all together. And he's like, that's strange. And when yeah. this singer friend had mentioned it to Edward, he had realized he had actually given the stone and like the jewelry to another friend. So they reach out to this other friend and they're like, hey, what's going on? And this intrigue and this mystery is like really building. Edward also reaches out to Colonel Ferris's son and is now piecing things together. Mm hmm. The friend that currently had the stone was experiencing so much turmoil and was like in distress. So Edward now is like really quickly putting the pieces together and is like, something is wrong with the stone. That's what these dreams are. There's something wanting it back and it is cursing us. So based on the evidence, maybe it's best that they dispose of the stone is the suggestion. And so they did. Edward threw it into the river and turned away and was like, that will get rid of everything. He wipes his hands clean. He's like, it's gone. Good. Curse will be removed. Everything will be fine. But the stone was not done with him. A couple of weeks later, <sighs> the stone showed up back at his door. Oh, my gosh. This kind of feels like it follows where it's just like it defaults back to the last person who owned it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't pass on until you pass. You it have on. to pass it on. Yeah. So this is what happened. A couple days or weeks after Edward threw the stone into the river. A man was dredging up the river and doing his, you know, ooh, what fun things can I find in the water? And then he was stunned to find this beautiful amethyst. And bless this man's soul because what a good human character. He's like, this is so beautiful and so precious that there's no way someone would have thrown it in here on purpose. They must be mm -hmm. so devastated they lost this. So he decides to bring it to a local jeweler and he's like, I don't know. You probably know a lot of people in the industry. Maybe you can help find the owner. The chances of this, he ends up bringing it to the jeweler who actually in the first place set the stone for Edward. So he's like, I actually, I made this. Wow. Yeah. I do have questions. Like how many jewelers existed <laughs> then? <laughs> Was it like the choice between three? Sure. But even then, like the fact that it still ended up to that exact person. And right. it's, it's so many things where it's Edward very clearly disposed of it and was like, I don't ever mm -hmm. want to see this again. Yeah. And the stone made its way back. Like the man right. who was dredging up the river could have kept it. What a cool find. But then he brought it to the jeweler who actually made it for Edward. So this jeweler is like, yes. I actually know that I made this for Edward. And so he just, you know, happily, excitedly thinking he's going to bring the best news to Edward, goes to Edward's home, knocks on his door, brings back the cursed stone. No, again. Oh, no. It's so strange because it does feel like the stone has a consciousness and it's like trying to kind of like crawl back, go backwards as far maybe as it can to try to like sure. find the solution. Oh, I'm also confused as to why. So Edward's getting these messages from this like deity or whatever saying like, I need my lost item. Mm -hmm. Like he has the item. Wouldn't that I just know. be, how are they supposed to, what's next? <laughs> well, here's the thing is like Edward sounds like such a, smart man. He has traveled the world. He's studied so many different languages and cultures. And it's one of these things where Edward gets the amethyst back and he's horrified. And he apparently tries to get rid of it multiple times again and it keeps returning to him. So he, he's just like, what do I do? You would think, mm -hmm. and I know it's really easy for us now looking back to be like, okay, well, I would return to sender. How do I get it back to where it belongs? Clearly, this deity right. is saying, I want it back. Give it back. Why not give it back? But how do you give it back? You go to India and return it to that area or to that culture or to a different temple yeah. that is built for Indra, the Hindu god. I guess, yeah, to the temple. Because that's what I'm thinking. It's like, where specifically? Like, what is the answer? Is it just like the general returning it to as best you can? Or is there like... You know, I'm thinking of in movies where it's like you have to place the stone in this one little section yeah. of a larger rock. And then that finally What's the releases game? whatever. What was the game show? Uh, the Hidden Temple? Uh, the Hidden Temple. Oh, my God. Legends of the Hidden Temple. Yeah, that game. Oh, my gosh. That was I was about to say that was so fun. Like we got to play. But, but it was like, kind of scary. Vicariously through other kids. It was scary. They were like the like monkeys that would jump out. 
you know what this actually really, really reminded me uh, of is Billy the Idol and... Yeah, I was thinking that when you were talking about it. What's the other one? The the Unbinding, like Greg and Dana with... Crone of Catskills. The Crone of Catskills. Like a lot of like, Mm -hmm. this was stolen, taken from a place that it never should have been taken from. And it's clearly acting up because there's some type of energy or being a spirit attached to it that doesn't want to be where it is. And so it is Mm -hmm. impacting people who have it, maybe not out of a malicious intent, but of uh, anger and a feeling of being mistreated, you know, like it needs to be returned to where it belongs. So after multiple times of trying and failing to actually dispose of the amethyst stone and Edward now has a young daughter in 1904, he is like a newborn baby. He decides out of fear, he's very frightful that this is going to in like be passed down to his daughter and impact her life. And he's like, I do not want yeah. anything bad to come to my daughter. So he decides to try something else. And no, it's not return to sender. He decides to lock the amethyst away, far away from him, far away from his daughter, far away from his wife, far away from anyone, because he would not be able to live with himself if his daughter were ever to be impacted by the curse. So he locked it in one box, not just one. He put that box inside of another box and that box inside of another box and in another and in another until it was in seven boxes, all locked, enclosing and trapping the amethyst stone far, far, far away from him. He surrounded this cage that he made, his makeshift cage, with good luck charms, and he placed it in a safety deposit box at his bank. Included in this safety deposit box was a letter. And I'm going to read the letter to you. Okay. To whomsoever shall be the future possessor of this amethyst. These lines are addressed in mourning before he or she shall assume the responsibility of owning it. This stone is terribly accursed and is stained with blood and the dishonor of everyone who has ever owned it. It was looted from the treasure of the temple of the god Indra at Kanpur during the Indian mutiny in 1855 and brought to this country by Colonel W. Ferris of the Bengal Cavalry. He then recounts, you know, everything I told you about the Colonel right. Ferris. I am glad that he knows all the, the backstory. Like he knows the history. Because he did a lot of research. Too. Right. Yeah. yeah. Once he started putting it together, he found the man who gave it to him. He kind of put this all together. He writes, from the moment I had it, misfortunes attacked me until I had bound round with double headed snake that had been on a finger ring of Hadon the astrologer, looped up with zodiacal plaques and neutralized between Hadon's magic tau and two amethyst. Garak Boai of <laughs> Queen Havasu's period bought from Thebes. So he basically did a lot of due diligence in building this, like trying to make it protected. Right, yeah. It remained thus quietly until 1902, thought not only I, but my wife, Professor Ross, W.H. Ryder, and Mrs. Hayden frequently saw in my library the Hindu yoga who haunts the stone trying to get it back. He sits on his heels in the corner of the room digging in the floor with his hands as if searching for it. So not only is he's having these dreams and these nightmares of this Hindu deity trying to get it back, members of his family and friends have seen this entity in the library of his home, like digging, looking for it. Wow. I feel that it is exerting a baleful influence over my newborn daughter, so I am now packing it in seven boxes and depositing it at my bankers with directions that it is not to see the light again until I have been dead 33 years. Whoever shall open it shall first read this warning, and then do so as he pleases with the jewel. My advice to him or her is to cast it into the sea. I am forbidden to do so by the Roscurian Oath, or I would have done it long ago. Signed, Edward Heron Allen, October 1904. So I don't know what he was forbidden, like I don't know what that oath was that he took Yeah, that meant he could not throw it into the sea. For some reason, he was not able to. Edward Heron Allen lived to be 81 years old. He died on March 28, 1943, which meant if following his instructions, that stone was not to be opened until 1976 at the earliest. That was not that long ago. Yeah. So a lot of this stuff actually is very present that I will tell you now. Upon his death, Edward's daughter actually sent the gem to the British Museum of Natural History along with the note. So Basically, she didn't open it, but the bank security de- deposit box now is like in her possession. And instead of her continuing to pay for it, she was just like, I'm going to put this in the hands of people who 
study history and historical objects and send mm-hmm. it to the Natural History Museum. So this stone and the note sat in a drawer. But then a young curator named Richard Sappin came in. He was new to the museum and he found this stone, but it was 1972, four years before it was said to be opened. And he decided to open the letter and instead of dispose of it in the sea, as was suggested, he only saw history and immense value in the stone. So he decided to take it to a symposium. And remember how I told you to keep in mind the god Indra and how they were the god of thunder, thunder and rain? Thunder and lightning. Oh, thunder and rain. And lightning too, I guess. Because Richard is driving to the symposium with his wife in the car. And he was on, I don't know if it was a documentary or just like a special, but it was called Museum Mm -hmm. Secrets on History Channel. And Richard Savin recounts his experience. He and his wife were driving to the symposium and he said, we drove through the most amazing storm we'd ever witnessed. Lightning was flashing on both sides of my car and my wife was shouting at me, throw that damn jewel away. We shouldn't have brought it. (laughs) (laughs) Thunderstorms struck the entire drive, the entire journey to the symposium and Upon arriving at the symposium, Richard came down with like such utter pain. He developed kidney stones on that drive. What the fuck? Yes. This is so crazy. I'm also curious how long of a drive it was. Like, was it three hours? Was it 40 minutes? Know. I don't know. I bet it felt longer with like the terrible rainstorms. Yeah. Apparently, every time subsequent to this that Richard has traveled with the stone, it has thundered and he has felt sick. He has gotten nauseous. But he, in this documentary, in this special, is like, it's all just a coincidence. I don't believe it's the power of the stone. I kind of believe this whole story is made up and it's just like, whatever. Are you kidding me? (laughs) Heed the warnings of those who've suffered before you. Right? The stone sat on display and still does at the British Museum of Natural History. And here's another photo of it on display. In 2004, so even more recent, only 20 years ago, another member of the Natural History Museum, John Whitaker, was tasked with transporting the cursed amethyst to another event. So this was not on his own volition. He was tasked. It was his job. He's at work. He's got to do this. You get fired if you don't do it. And it was specifically a Heron Allen event because I think, you know, he's so infamous in history. So he had one of the most horrific experiences of his life. He was driving towards the event when suddenly they were engulfed in a terrible thunderstorm, one so bad it trapped them in their car. Like they had to pull over and couldn't. The thunder. I'm so, so curious if there was any like meteorologist who could be studying where this thunderstorm goes and if it's like literally just tracking and following the amethyst. John Whitaker was tasked to travel with the stone three times. Every time there were thunderstorms. One of the times, so the first time it was just thunderstorms. The second time it was thunderstorms and he came down with like a sudden stomach bug where he was like violently ill the third Mm -hmm. time thunderstorms and a kidney stone i'm at a loss for words because i'm just frustrated at the people who never believe things and i feel like this is more than proving i know that you are not supposed to mess with the stone and also the british museum has so many goddamn artifacts that need to be returned to their rightful places truly (laughs) that whole museum So now it's on display at the Natural History Museum in London. There are a lot of people who believe that this entire story was a hoax because Edward Heron Allen did write. So all of his fictional novels that Edward Heron Allen wrote were written under a pseudonym, like a pen name, Mm -hmm. because he was such like a scientific man. You know, he wanted to have a separation of self when it came to his fiction and his academic papers. But in 1921, so keep in mind, Edward inherits the stone in 1890, locks it away in 1904. In 1921, he writes this fictional novel called The Purple Sapphire. He writes this book, The Purple Sapphire, and it is kind of about a cursed stone. So people are Mm -hmm. like, was this all just some weird like marketing ploy? But it's like, I think he wrote it based on his experience because he had to process it. Yeah, totally. And also, he locked the stone away in 1904 and didn't write this book until 1921. So clearly, he processed the trauma. He kind of got away from it and felt maybe perhaps that the curse was no longer impacting him. So he felt comfortable writing about it. Yeah. And I feel like you people write what they know. So it's like, if he wanted to dabble in a fictional book, like what better 
And it's also so interesting, too, to be cursed by something yeah. like this. And also, given the two experiences, or like the multiple experiences by the curators at the museum, like, come on, those are not coincidences. that like Both years they both apart, 1972 stones? and then 2004 and on, they're experiencing the exact same things right. while traveling with the stone. No. And thunderstorms don't give you kidney stones either. They don't. But cursed so, amethysts might. Apparently so, do. Despite some people believing it's all a hoax, this stone is now at the Natural History Museum in London. And those close to the family and myself and probably you too, Corinne, swear that this is cursed. It plagued Edward and so many around him and before him and should never have been stolen from the temple of Indra. Agreed. I would not want to mess with this stone at all. In fact, now I'm suddenly having a passion rise within me where we need the stone to be returned to where it belongs. Should we do a great heist of the Natural History Museum and yeah, I think so. I think <laughs> return it to we India? We need to steal the amethyst that was stolen, a double steal, which makes it not steal. stolen anymore because they cancel each other out. Right. That's what, it, yeah, that's how it works. A stolen item that's stolen is no longer stolen. Yeah. And, and then, then we, we bring it back to Indra. Yes. Here you go. No longer do you have to be crawling on your hands and knees looking for it. We bring it right. to you. I know. We that makes me so return. sad. So long. Good luck. Because clearly a lot of other things were stolen from those temples, but this one clearly had such significance. Yeah. I'm curious if other things that were stolen experienced some element of the curse or if it was just specifically the stone. I don't know. Yeah. And doesn't it kind of make you believe in all of these? This is one of those other things too, where it's like, Okay, people are having dreams of these deities and of these gods and stuff. And it maybe it's not legend. Maybe these spirits do exist. Are they mm -hmm. spirits? Are they alien creatures that we're trying to understand? Is this all weird yeah. simulation? Like, who is this? Our creators. And who are we? That's the, <laughs> honestly, that's the question that we'll never have an answer to. You know what? Okay, for just pause for a second. Didn't you feel like growing up, my perception was you reached a point, you knew who you were, and like life was smooth sailing. What I've realized mm -hmm. and been smacked in the face with by reality is that no one ever fully knows who they are. They have ideas of who they are, but we're always evolving and changing and growing and learning and constant chaos. Yeah, but then it's like, are you ever who you are? Like, is there any, is there any you? Like, that doesn't make sense, but it's like... Are you just the collection of perceptions of who you yeah, think you right? are and everyone else thinks you are? Is there even a true you or is that you? And then also a true you can't possibly exist because we are so heavily influenced by our surroundings and society and culture and expectations and stereotypes. Like the true you is always going to be a perception and mm -hmm. A falsity. And then if we think of our spirits moving on, do we absorb the knowledge of that and then have this like true us before we move on to the next life? What is This is why be? we should just spend our days studying asparagus and uh, just enjoy it. Do whatever. We're never going to really know. We're never going to know. It's so weird. So eat your asparagus, pluck it out of the ground and don't steal amethysts. Yeah. Or don't send us your stolen amethysts. There was a side story where I think, and I didn't get all the details, but I think Caesar Augustus in the like challenges of people like seeing who could run the fastest with like so that uh -huh. they could bring the asparagus to him quicker. Apparently, <laughs> there were people who would fashion the asparagus onto their heads and run it up to the top of the mountain and store it up there so that they could freeze it for the winter. Oh, wow. Honestly, kind of brilliant. Interesting that they wear a crown of asparagus. Okay, here's. This does sound so silly. So now I'm starting to wonder if this all was a joke that he just kept going and kind of like, was he not actually obsessed with asparagus? He just did it as a joke and then didn't let go of the joke. And it just became more and more and more involved over time. I think he was obsessed with asparagus. Like, I really think he was. It's kind of like how the Who's <laughs> are obsessed with Christmas. Like, I think Augustus, Caesar Augustus was obsessed, obsessed with, with asparagus. asparagus and he would have asparagus festivals and if he could have, he would have had a crown of asparagus. He could have. All but he'd rather did. eat it. He doesn't want to waste it. Oh, that's true. What a weird guy. <laughs> <laughs> we love weird people. We are weird, too. Yeah, fair. Okay, I have an email. This is from our listener, Daniel, and it is called My First Time and My Family Hex. Dearest Corinne and Sabrina, 
I wanted to share two stories that have pretty much shaped my beliefs in the paranormal. My first encounter with a spirit that saved me from getting hurt when I was a kid and my family's encounter with a vindictive bruja. Oh, When I was around five or six, my grandmother took care of me while my parents worked. It was your typical suburban ranch house in the early 90s, and my bedroom was at the very top of the stairs. I've always had a wild imagination, and at the age that I was then, I was obsessed with Power Rangers and (laughs) X-Men. Probably not the best role models for a creative kid because I was adamant that I could teach myself how to fly. Oh, no. I remember starting a few steps from the bottom, practicing jumping with my arms wide in the air and landing on my feet. I must have been really convinced that I was meant to be a part of the Mutant Academy. Eventually, I decided that I was ready to basically start from the far wall of my bedroom with the open door, run full speed to jump off the very top step. What happened next is very foggy, as my vision went blurry. What I do remember were two hands that grabbed me from underneath my arms as if they plucked me out of the air mid-flight and set me down on the bottom step. It happened in a split second, and even at that age, I realized what I had just done, and I knew that I should not have landed that gently on both of my feet. I was going to say, I feel like that would have convinced him that he can do it, that he can fly. I felt my wings. My wings. (laughs) Oh my god! It was like two strong arms came from behind me and tugged me backwards. I should have truly injured myself with my juvenile antics, but to this day, I'm convinced that a friendly spirit has been watching over me my entire life. My Catholic family calls it my guardian angel, but I think that sounds a bit cheesy. Over the years, I became more aware of my interest in the paranormal thanks to my family, and I was raised on ghost stories even at that age. It was a normal topic at the family dinner table. I love it. My grandmother would watch shows on spiritualism and tarot and astrology, etc., and I would absorb all of them just as much as, are you afraid of the dark? Later in life, I tried to contact that spirit through tarot, but that's a whole nother email. I'd like to think that I was successful. Now, on to something a bit darker. My dad has worked in real estate since I can remember, and he was very successful. He's a smooth talker from a ranch town in Colombia, and he can basically sell anyone anything. (laughs) (laughs) At one point, he joined a new firm that his broker friend decided to open, and the success continued. That is, until they brought on a new team member. I don't remember her name, but she was a younger lady from the Dominican Republic, and she was eager for success. My dad was a friendly guy, but he was a little too busy to try to take a newbie under his wing. He kept my mom and his friend in the loop about the whole situation since this persistent woman kept pushing to the point where he was uncomfortable to work with her in the same agency. Eventually, emotions boiled over and the woman had a breakdown and left the agency after making a scene at the company holiday party. Soon after she left, my dad began to have multiple health issues. His real estate business began to suffer and deals kept falling through even with clients whom he'd worked with for years. The constant money flow came to a sudden halt, to the point where he went months without any transactions due to his clients having strange circumstances, like pipes bursting at properties during inspections or clients being robbed and having to back out of contracts, etc. When strange things began to happen at the ranch in Colombia, my Catholic parents sought the help of the church. Our cattle had developed a virus that began to kill them off, And even the pregnant cows began to have miscarriages. Oh, my God! A bug also latched onto the coffee and the crops. And the ranch that had been self-sufficient for years began to unravel in a matter of months. Oh, my gosh. My parents spoke to their friends at the church. And a woman told my dad that she could sense that someone had put a curse on him. Being Catholic from Latin America, my family is not only religious, but also has a very open mind to the world of the occult. I mentioned that I grew up listening to stories of brujeria and the paranormal, so this must have been an easy conversation for them. My dad knew that this had something to do with that woman from the Dominican and began working with their friends on digging deeper into this cause and into this curse. Eventually, my dad decided to move offices for a new beginning. Now, this is where the story gets fucking insane. More than it already is? My gosh. My dad began to move the furniture and rug out from his office And he noticed carvings in the wood floor under his desk. (gasps) After he pulled everything out, they discovered that these carvings were actually lines and shapes mixed with words that they didn't recognize. They moved paintings and photos from the walls, and they found more markings and stains as if someone had taken soot and smudged the walls. My parents were terrified, and they knew that their friends from church had been right. 
He eventually cleaned everything up and completed the move to the new office, making sure to perform a proper cleansing of himself and the new space for safety and protection. It didn't take long for things to normalize after an entire year of torment, and my dad was back to business. Things brightened up in Colombia, and eventually he felt healthy again. To this day, he knows that that woman had used black magic to cause him harm. My parents never bring it up, and they still bless and cleanse their house often. Thank you for taking the time to read some of my family history, and don't forget, when in doubt, sage it out. Cheers, Daniel. I'm so curious if, like, because I can't imagine that this woman moved his desk and did all of this stuff and, like, hand-carved it. I wonder if she did something in her own space, in her own home, with, like, such concentration and focus Mm -hmm. on Mm -hmm. Daniel's father. The energy did that. Like, you know, I'm imagining it was a projected curse rather than like an actual right. her there carving it that is curious because the soot i can see herself her doing that but it does feel like so much effort she would have to go under the disguise of night and like break into the office yeah. essentially and do all of that to have it not be noticed which is possible if she was so pissed but like also why is she so pissed there's other people at the office like someone right. else can help you out study what he's doing like you don't need him to sit down and tell you and tell you but also maybe it wasn't about real estate maybe she had a big fat crush on him and wouldn't take no for an answer it had to be something else and also like something it's one of those things where if you look at edward heron allen who used his time to invest in so many different topics and and interests this woman Mm -hmm. is clearly investing a lot of time in in energy into putting a negative energy and curse and hex on this man Go study some asparagus. Grow some asparagus. I don't know. Yeah. Violins. Or another you job. You really have the power Real to estate. do things. <laughs> Imagine you're very smart and have a lot of energy and power. You can utilize it and put it into something perhaps more beneficial for you because i can't imagine she's benefiting from cursing someone else no although i'd put money on this not being the first curse that she has put out there yeah probably true seemed too quick and easy to kind of default to something so dark without any regret too you know like his health the farm his business clients you know like it was affecting everyone that he was working with too this is really really making me need to ask my dad to write down all of his hauntings he's ever experienced and do my you should sabrina episode part two but it's my family you absolutely should i'm gonna text him right after this that'd be so fun because he, he also has so many and even remember i was talking to my cousin recently and she was like pulling ghost stories out from my aunt which is my dad's yeah. sister about and, your that dad they had never heard so maybe if i can't get my dad on the phone i'll, I'll call my aunt yeah get the scoop All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for listening. If you have spooky stories or anything to do with the paranormal, please email them to us at twogirlsoneghostpodcast at gmail.com. If you can't remember what our email is, you can always check the show notes. We include that email in every single show note description for every episode. You can also find it on social media and on our website, twogirlsoneghost.com. And then if you're watching the YouTube video, Jamie also adds it on the bottom of the screen. You can pause it real quick and write it down. If you would like access to every episode one week early and ad free, you can join us on Patreon. We have one tier over there. It's the most haunted friend. For $5 a month, you get episodes one week early, ad free. You get one bonus episode every single month. You get access to Campfire Stories live every Tuesday and so much more. You get a sticker, you get quarterly book club, book club. and so many fun surprises. So join us over there. Uh, you also get direct contact to us. We answer all your DMs right away. Join us there. We have merch. We have a variety of ways to support us, but we really do appreciate you coming back each week to listen to our episodes. And we also really appreciate Jamie Ryan, who produces and edits our podcast, yes. both the audio and the video. So shout out to Jamie. We love you, girl. We love you. And we also love all of you so, so much. And we will see you on the other, other. Sigh.